So uh, there are seven projects uh, this evening. This is uh, their houses that they designed at the beginning of the semester. And um, we're going to start with Elif Erez. Uh, next up is Kia Chen, Piraya Suposida. Hi, I'm Elif from Istanbul, Turkey. And the title of this project is Barn, 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 Barn for Barn. <laughs> and what follows is a journey from small to big and back, from house to tower. It begins with the shiplap joint, a typically small scale residential rain screen siding material. And I chose to explore this joint blown up to the scale of CLT in the house. And here, it has the ability to perform tectonically, where the angle of the oversized CLT joint changes to correspond to where the cantilevering loads the A-frame volume of the house below it. We might have a sticky slide. And in the tower, the shiplap joint gets scaled up further. And this time, it's a mega at the ground. Thanks. We can't hear you. Okay. Oh, uh, I think the connections a little spotty um all right so the three cores uh support 70 percent of the vertical loads while the facade acts in resistance to the wind loads um and here you can see there are two virandial trusses spanning two floors above outdoor terraces uh, which transfer loads from the facade to the core through cross walls that alternate direction uh, on every floor. I think the slide is maybe not advancing on its own, or maybe my connection is a little spotty. And taking a hint from an early housing model in Sweden that incorporates collective childcare. The tower combines housing and working with collective childcare and collective education. And the ground floor is a public library, the middle tier are offices, and the top is housing. And each chunk of program is connected through a combination of outdoor terraces and collective childcare spaces. In plan, the three cores are wrapped by a thickened band of circulation that pushes the main program to the and only one set of elevators goes to the office floors while one goes to the residential. And the tower points slightly off of the street and cardinal grids, avoiding both showing itself directly on a corner or playing to a face. And this is the construction sequence simplified showing the structural system and facade assembly. This is the facade clad in brushed metal in two slightly different tones. And being off center to the grid, uh, of the streets, the triangular volume remains elusive. And as the windows hit at different points all over the tower, there's a variety of situations visible from the inside. At one point, the window can be at a tall table height. At another, it may be at seating height, a floating corner with smaller shiplap and the base with larger shiplap. The outdoor terrace, and that's the journey. Thank you for listening. Um, next, we have Kiat. Hi, everyone. My name is Kiat Chin. I'm from Yungo, Myanmar. My project's title, Table Stack. The project title emerges from observing the IKEA furniture catalog, where vary, varying scales of tables are stacked. As the scale of furniture changes, so does its function. A table can be used as a chair and vice versa. Can this method be employed in the design of a CLT tower? The project provoked this notion of stacking to re-envision an IKEA headquarter using CLT. Across American landscape, department stores like Walmart and Target monetize itself on the American bigness. 
comparable to these big box stores, IKEA utilizes American bigness to introduce the Scandinavian effect. This is an IKEA plaza in Almhead, Sweden. Using this master plan as a case study, various programs are extracted to re-envision a sprawled IKEA headquarters as a vertically stacked tower. The programs are scaled according to the square footage and stacked. As the user moves up the tower, the IKEA products are viewed as co-vetted art pieces within the museum to own objects within individual apartment units. Utilizing the nature of CLT's massness and blankness, four generic tables are created based on six meter by six meter grid overlaid on the site. In type one, the tabletop is supported by four pinwheel legs. In type two, the legs are offset to achieve a cantilever top. Type three and four are scaled accordingly to the grid. These generic tables are then scaled vertically, then stacked, nested, and rotated in various configurations to accommodate specific programs while creating spatial hierarchy. As the tables are scaled, the tabletops span farther and table, le table, table legs are lengthened. The diagram system helps the top for spanning and diagonal walls raises the legs. The entire system then transfer loads to the core. The result is a column-free plan that accommodates the diverse programs of IKEA headquarters. The ground plan illustrates the museum entry on the west, hotel entry on the south, and residential entry on the east, all connected with the core. The core also acts as entry point for three type of apartment unit. Each unit has a loft resulted from the rotation of the tabletop. The facade utilizes CNC technology to route CLT panels in the aesthetic of a draped tablecloth. Similar to conventional construction methods used in big box stores, CLT panels are tilted up in place and assembled. The panel is then cladded with anodized aluminum and cedar shingles to protect it from moisture exposure. The detail illustrates the exterior wall buildup of an individual facade unit. A five-ply CLT is used as a sacrificial layer to generate the aesthetic of a draped cloth. The ISO section shows the various programs nested within the table stack achieved by the flexibility of the column-free plan. Both cedar shingle, a domestic material of a home in anodized aluminum, and industrial material of an office mimic the tone of the CLT to reinterpret the aesthetic of the tower. Thank you. Um, and up next is myself. My name is Piraya Sovacit. I will now present my project, Columnization. Each second, the world emits 761 tons of carbon. Making a cubic meter of concrete releases 152 kilogram of the substance. A single human breath consists of 0 0.046 gram of CO2 content, while in a year, one tree absorbs about 21 kilograms through the process of photosynthesis. Softwood typical in construction store about one ton of CO2 in one cubic meter volume. As a reference, I look to a pre-Civil War typology called the antebellum, a neoclassical type from the American South. Its column mimic that classical origin, the massive volume and material quality signify human's dominance over its environment. What does it mean for us to construct now? In response to climatic demand and rapid population growth, would it be possible to pivot away from what we have always known and understood? If column, the most common architectural element has always been constructed out of stone and understood to be massive, perhaps it is only appropriate that we now erect the same element which would defy the with engineer timber. Unlike its predecessor, the mass timber column may not be very ornate. Its beauty will be instead signified by the amount of CO2 sequestered in the process. Massive interlocking timber blocks make up the surrounding column. They are the main element of the house, holding up the entablature roof as well as the interior living quarter. 880 tons of CO2 is sequestered in the process of making this building. The exterior element is contracted with solid timber unit why the inner livable space is constructed with CLT sheet. As one gazes outside and measure oneself again what one sees, perhaps one can start to contemplate how many more massive elements must man will in order to absorb and store enough CO2. For the tower construction, mass timber column defy the perimeter of the building. First the core, then the column, then the grillage are electric as one floor is built after the next. The grillage acts as the secondary structure, transferring vertical load of the inner volume to the building core and then to the external column. Some columns are articulated with programmatic function, auditorium, meeting rooms, external garden, and even smaller spaces for wildlife inhabitation. 
Each of them interact in a unique way to the interior program. There are five open public floor while the residential unit are stacked in between. Programmatic function is nested in the massive column. The main program incorporates the interior space of the adjacent column while the rest are left as solid. These are typical floor plan of the building and the residential floors. Because of the, its structural redundancy, mass timber columns are allowed to age naturally, forming a protective patina layer over time. On the ground level, programs that are embedded inside the exterior column can be operated independently from the main building. The material quality of wood and its massive volume signify what I perceive as the shared agenda of our time. With its massive re and its redundant construction, the building makes a case for the urgency in which CO2 should be sequestered from our environment. The rate in which we are growing now by far surpass any in the past civilization. The more massive the timber construction, the more CO2 will be sequestered and trust the more chance of us sustaining our livelihood. Thank you. Up next, we have Alejandro. Hello, everyone. My name is Alejandro. I'm a Colombian architect, and today I'll be presenting my project that I have titled Paper Slab and Ready-Made Column. The project was born out of the challenge of turning the heavy and unyielding properties of the CLT blank into delicate, fluid, and sculptural properties like those of a wooden peel. Therefore, the tower was envisioned as a stack of paper-like CLT slabs as a conceptual cornerstone, which would question the modular properties of mass timber. Rethinking the slab as part of a system rather than a separate element led me to propose a virendal beam system, where slab thinness could be maximized by increasing the number of vertical elements in the system. For the vertical elements inside the beam, I investigated different types of columns that each material rendered. This inspired me to rethink the three-ply CLT blank as a ready-made column covered in chrome as fire protection and ornament. This reflection upon the tectonic properties and structural logic of CLT proposes a new type to the mid-rise tower, the CLT free plan scheme. Set type allows for program flexibility and diversity throughout the building's life, which challenges the traditional typologies for wooden towers. As a result, the tower's structural system consists of a grand central core, which deals with 100% of the lateral forces. The inhabitable virendal beams and the CLT columns within them support the vertical loads generated in the thin slabs. In this image, you can see the unnatural tectonics of mass timber, where the architecture is the structure, and the program is hermetically sealed by glass boxes and curtains. The highest box holds a public library program, which is complemented with flexible exterior spaces where a diversity of activities may happen. In the two following program boxes, you can start to evidence the open office floor plan possibilities in the CLT free plan scheme. The defining detail of the proposal was the union between CLT column and slab. By covering the ready-made blank column in reflective chrome, the vertical element effortlessly disappears, giving the impression that the paper-thin slabs are floating amongst a forest of vanishing columns, where an unusual sense of levity is found. The section of the proposal testifies to the diverse activities that can be held inside the free plan scheme and how the Virendal structural concept allows for different floor heights and spatial relationships. Although the concept started out as an investigation to challenge the properties of the CLT blank, the design proved to alter traditional structural and spatial types for the mass timber tower, rendering a stack of Virendal beams composed of paper-like slabs and vanishing ready-made columns that hold within a free plan that will allow the building to change throughout the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Alejandro. And up next is Ian. Hi, my name is Ian Groskow. I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio, and currently in the MR program at the GST. The title of my project is Precarious Assembly. Locating the project in downtown Raleigh, North Carolina, allowed me to leverage some of the architectural and cultural characteristics of the South as starting point for my investigation. On the left is a photo of the Southern architectural type, the Charleston a series of stacked volumes and porches that highlights significance of the porch for the sound, visually dynamic and compelling fabric. This translated to a stacked tower at 108 meters with shifting floor plates in both directions to create a series of cantilevers and a series of terraces echoing the Charleston single. The terraces and mega cantilevers are visually connected but physically separated within the CLT core through alternating atriums. 
The resultant structure created natural leaning towards different programmatic types at different scales with residential units and terraces and offices in the mega cantilevers. On the office side, the floor plates could accommodate a variety of floor plate needs from small design studios to financial services. Within the residential program, a similar pattern occurs. Structurally, the tower is composed of six CLT components. The raking column, column, wall, floor plate, structural core, and structural spine. The CLT core and structural spine carry the vertical and lateral loads. The raking members in conjunction with the columns act as a mega cantilever which support the floor plates and walls above by tying back to the structural spine. The structure freed the facade to express the idea of mass production by removing material from 2D sheets using laser cutters and CNC machines, while purposefully misinterpreting the self-similar shapes of the quilts of G's bin to read at the scale and proportions of CLT. On the exterior, the CLT is given a charred timber treatment to preserve the wood from the elements while retaining its materiality. On the interior, it's left exposed. Applying it to the two flat facades on the east and west both mediated the harshest light and allowed for the expression of both the structural and aesthetic capabilities of CLT. On the east and west, CLT becomes an aesthetic of mass production and mass customization, while the north and south showcase the stacked nature of the CLT as structured. In the units, the scale of CLT becomes obscured by the floor plates and leaves units with unique apertures dilating the amount of light lit in. In the atriums, the CLT blanks are seen in their entirety as exposed timber paying homage to their scale and the materiality of the tower. At the scale of the site, the tower defines itself as deriving from both the CLT material and its southern origins, show, showing CLT as mass-produced, southern-inspired aesthetic on one side, while on the other, a structural stack with cantilevers and porches that lends itself towards the American South. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ian. Um, next, we have Edward. Hello, I'm Edward from Myanmar, and my project is called CLT equals cross laminated tower. I began with a provocation. Since CLT is made up of cross laminated planks, might it produce architecture that is also cross laminated? Back in the house project, vertical spine walls cross laminated to form the primary structure supporting the floors and ceilings, and allowed the strategy of cross lamination to be expressed in elevation. Moving from house to tower, can this strategy of cross-lamination scale up into a cross-laminated residential tower? The tower structural grid, a core and shear walls, is extruded and rotated 45 degrees because everyone has a good side, and so does CLT. The massing is divided into reoriented and split apart, revealing the tower's bare CLT structure at entry level and a mid-tower sky terrace. The core and cross walls constitute the primary structure and support the floors and ceilings, which in turn support the facade. This structural system gives the exterior CLT wall panels the flexibility to cross laminate from floor to floor. While most CLT projects cover the CLT up with jipboard, might a CLT case tower not only express its structure, but graphically diagram it? And how can CLT blanks and CNC routing technology do just that? Drawing from Sam Jacobs' plank scarf where the image of wood is commodified to OMA's Casa de Musica, where wood is literally gold, enlarged and embossed over plywood, this project takes a CLT blank, stains it, and routes enlarged wood grain to produce a new kind of oversized wood paneling. It spans the height of the tower to produce graphic sectional continuity, yet because of CLT's capacity to mass customize, no two segments of the pattern are the same. Sectional cutouts provide double height communal spaces throughout the tower. The floors and ceilings double up with gaps in between, concealing the metal brackets that join the floor and ceiling panels to the cross walls. This is made possible by the tower's volumetric construction system. In a factory offsite, CLT panels are precision cut, mitered, and pre-assembled into modules, complete with kitchen, bath, and fixtures. They get packed, transported to site, and stacked onto the building via cranes, expediting on-site construction time. 
Like the sheer wallpaper, the facade CLT panels are routed the same enlarged wood grain pattern, but completely routed through at points to become fenestration. The result on the interiors is that the effect of wood is not just stained or routed, but also a play on light and shadow. If the image of wood sells, the shadow of wood might be priceless. Thank you. Thank you, Abe. And lastly, we have Daniel. My name is Daniel. I'm from San Francisco, and I spent the semester looking at mass timber and CLT through a post-digital lens. So CLT manufacturing is significantly more efficient than conventionally framed buildings and is made using a highly digitized process, yet it seems that most CLT structures don't leverage this condition for anything other than precision and rapid manufacture. I'm interested in how the ongoing digitization of our environment can inform CLT construction. The house project synthesizes multiple references such as southern vernacular and culture, Scandinavian materiality, and post-digital trends in contemporary art to speculate on CLT at the scale of a single family house. Here, the quintessential Southern phenomenon of big hair is transposed into the realm of architecture by exaggerating the roof pitch and routing overscaled patterns into the CLT interiors. For the tower project, I looked at artists like Lucas Blalock, Issa Genskin, and Laura Owens, whose work flattens distinctions between digital and real, and I appropriated some of these ideas for my proposal. <clears throat> At first glance, the project resembles a generic post and beam tower, but upon closer inspection, massive brushstroke patterns provide structural stability while bringing visual character to lofty interiors. The project investigates CLT through image and tectonic and uses opticality to displace the reading of normative structural and material behavior. Sketches from a structural engineer addressing vertical and lateral loads are used as underlays for the brushstroke in order to maintain enough mass in the facade to resist loads, though they aren't simply indexing the structural responsibility of the CLT. The cores carry 100% of the vertical load, the floors are supported by the cores and are hung from the facade, which is continuous to the ground and supports vertical and lateral loads. Where loads need to be resisted, the oversized brushstroke acts as infill. The, uh, the tower is 386 feet tall and houses a design school in its top third, a co-working space in its bottom third, and a hybrid of the two in its middle third. And here is a typical co-working plan on the left and a typical studio and gallery plan on the right. The facade is composed of large CLT blanks that maximize their spanning capacity and that are partially routed through to reveal the grid where breaststrokes are needed for support. <clears throat> Interior views occasionally reveal the structural approach to the project with the brush stroke registering against the grid. Furniture throughout is also made of CLT drop cuts to minimize waste. And so as a relatively recent construction system, I would argue that CLT has a wide range of design possibilities that have yet to be explored due to properties that differ significantly from those of conventionally framed steel buildings. These projects aim to create a conversation around new techniques for combining ornament and performance at multiple scales. Thank you. And uh, to finally, to get the conversation going, I would argue that each of the seven projects uh, presented today, along with the projects presented yesterday, move beyond standard applications of CLT by challenging normative views of tectonic structure and aesthetics in mass timber. And so we welcome the panelists to expand or push back on this claim in the discussion. Before we do that, if I can just welcome Gilles Retzin, who came in uh, quite, uh, quite a little way into the presentations, and Viviana, who just managed to join us recently. And just to say at that point that we freed the students from worrying about fire, and with the exception of Piraya, worrying about uh, ecology too much, because we think these two are givens, and we were looking for design ideas. So over to the panel. Peter, you were making a lot of notes. Is he on mute?
Maybe I'll start because I, I joined really, really late. I've seen only the last two projects, uh, but um, uh, in terms of the, the agenda for, for, uh, for this uh, semester, it looks uh, a very challenging one because you are looking at the formal expression of uh, the CLT in a tower condition, but at the same time, you are trying to understand what are the structural logic and the performance and, and let's say the assembly method for the tower themselves and uh, it's really refreshing i, uh, I was uh, just finishing my uh, my review at the aa and we are also the topic is towers uh, not in CLC, uh, clt uh, but i think a lot of um, uh, the team touched uh, by the, the the project that i've seen are very much uh, of uh, central to the design of towers and especially towers in using CLT. Uh, the, 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 part, the part that maybe uh, needs for me a little bit more understanding is this idea of, you know, looking at ornament and uh, structure. So when I look at the, the, the already for me ornament, it's a, some sort of a old fashioned world to, and, and applies mostly bidimensionally whether a lot of the project that I see here, they, they are really trying to combine these double high spaces. It's, it's a very three-dimensional work that you are trying to do. So um, I, I was thinking whether there is something about uh, the word ornament and the use of uh, CLT uh, in the design of facade or interior spaces that we explain a little bit more. Okay, should we just go around the panel first and then maybe we come back to responding, Daniel, you might respond to that. Rose or Peter or Gills? Yeah, um, I, I think all the projects are really, uh, I mean, really interesting. Um, and it's nice that we don't have to talk about fire. Um, I was um, interested in, in actually how this meets the ground. It's, it's, it's a really unique opportunity um, of thinking of towers within an urban an urban realm, um, as this site is, and the experience of of the ground plan. Um, and I was really <coughs> interested in um, you know thinking about the possibilities. I think which. Piria, um, the colonization project is kind of monumentality, but actually having a relationship um, with um, with this play on scale. And um, I think that the opportunity with that is is really quite quite unique. And also looks back at some of the sort of medieval forms of timber buildings where you would get jetting and thinking about something of this scale and something with CLT that could almost appear to be floating. And then how one experiences this sort of timber, um, as well as some of the traditional techniques that we saw in the first project of this kind of lapped um, CLT panels at such a massive scale. I think But this through when you talk about mass timber and actually what the perception of mass actually means and how you know there, there could be something more playful about having these um, great sized members um, that, that we saw with those columns. And I second the, the last, I, I think one of the things that is challenging with CLT is that it has an aesthetic that we tend to. Uh, you know, be left with something that almost reflects the sauna. Uh, you know, it's rare that you see anyone. And, and, you know, there's so many great things you can do with stains. So it was very nice to see, you know, how one could carve stain and become more playful. Um, so, yeah, great opportunity, I would say. Thank you. Eels? Yeah, I mean, I'm... Um very fascinated by i think both the educational approach and of course also by the consequences of clt like i i for, for me i find clt so interesting because 
it almost resets architecture for me. It's literally kind of a blank. Like there's this like almost everything that we have learned in school or how we are educated seems to not be valid anymore. And we have to, to completely rethink um, uh, architecture itself. And, that, and that's for me um, extremely interesting. Um, I'm also interested in some of the kind of um, latent um, social or political provocations that I made in the projects. Like um, in, uh, for example, I mean, I like the kind of the perversity of the carbon sequestering project where it's almost said like, look, if we actually waste material, uh, we do the exact opposite of what we have been thought as architects. We're actually doing something good for the planet. It's a kind of a carbon dioxide uh, like, like, like offset scheme. And I like that kind of um, provocation uh, that was present in this project. And I think what, what all the projects um, share um, is almost a kind of a monolithic quality, not a not monolithic as in as in that it's made that that it's one whole, but it's more a monolithic as that it's a monolithic operation. There's a single operation that defines uh, everything in the building, and then yet in a strange way they're all also assembled. And I think that kind of contradiction or between being monolithic and being assembled is is very productive, right? I like I think that's um, that's really interesting. And um, I mean, I, I could keep going on about why, why I love this, uh, this, this aspects of CLT, but maybe, I mean, one more that I like, and then that maybe goes a bit more to the educational approach. I mean, I'm also as an educator convinced that a project uh, such as Dogma, the, the Danish um, film project is extremely productive for students by basically setting a set of very harsh constraints, like you will operate with a blank of CLT. It will be uh, just that, 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 that generates creativity, right? It's by taking away the kind of the vast scale of, of possibilities that we have otherwise, that you generate a very rigorous and, and um, radical project, I think. So, so in that sense, the kind of the dogma of the, of the blank, I think is, is really fascinating as an educational um, approach as well. I know Peter's dying to come in because he was muted. Peter, I'll give it to you before Daniel come or one of the I'm students. Sure the best solution to my life is a mute button. Um, <laughs> I, I found this really, really interesting. I, I'm completely impressed by that there's, there's this wonderful combination of kind of violence and discipline going on. And what um, I think it was Roz called ornament was really interesting because sometimes it was in the, the in the body of the building and sometimes it was explicitly you know referential and i was expecting buildings that were sort of like eva hesse's sculptures i completely take the point of clt having a do-goodism attached to it that one really wants to do violence to in the first place and i think there, uh, the, and, I, and I think your, your students, I mean, I don't know how much or how you organize supervisions or when you stopped. I'm sorry we didn't get more of the houses because they seem to have, um, they're operating obviously much more closely to what the CLT panel could do, but the little images of houses look quite intriguing and a, as it were, a more succinct argument than the demands of the towers. I completely take Gil's to point about the pedagogy through constraints, because I think that did have a lot to do with the success of the project and where people could find um, a kind of identity. I don't know if you tried to put an urban block together of all, of all your projects and what kind of town that would have made of that particular area. Um, I mean, those southern towns have their own kind of character, and some of them were more sensitive to front back to north south um, than others. And they didn't seem to be that much taller, though they were significantly taller than the context. So they, as a group, they would have generated an odd ground. I thought the um, uh, kind of town in a tower idea of mixed use and whether or not it was adaptable or not was 
something that was kind of independent of CLT, but it also seemed like CLT could be marshaled to generate settings that were sufficiently distinct um, that, um, and yet sufficiently common that the business of adaptability, I mean, the fear is that you'd simply end up with a lot of offices because none of the rest would be commercially successful or whether you need a code to make all of that, you know, is that social engineering or is that being open to what the town wants? And, you know, that can only happen by trying. But I, I thought the, the variety um, of student offerings, the different styles of, of thought. I mean, I, whether Alejandro's paper thin floors really work, it was, it was sufficiently sort of familiar and sufficiently radical. I mean, I'd, one thing everybody mostly decided was that tower was pretty much the same all the way up. And I don't know whether that's the consequence of CLT or whether that's just our inherited view of towers and or that grows out of the sheer structural constraints of what you can and can't get away with. But Alejandro seemed to offer like a really, you know, a, it's, it's a kind of, you know, um, instant barrio um, where you could just offer floor plates and people could colonize it um, without violating it. And I, I, most of this seems to be supplied, um, you know, as it were, conforming to a brief. But the, I, I don't know whether to call it ornament. I don't mind ornament. To me, that is a mediation between the fundamental conditions and history. So I'm, I, I think wood offers lots of opportunities for ornament that um, and for a movement between handcrafting and digital that other materials don't. So I'm very intrigued to see it tried at all sorts of scales. In my personal judgment, some work better than others, but I'm not really worried about that. I'm more interested in the scope and spread of, of initiatives and being able to um, overcome the the received notion of what CLT is or ought to be. Jennifer, Jennifer, yeah, do you want to any, Well, I was just going to say, um, I think the panel slip really picked up on, yeah, the pedagogy was really putting those four conceptual underpinnings, you know, in that kind of matrix at the beginning out towards the students and um, it was them up to them to figure out a formal method or a methodology uh, specific to their both architectural and structural concept. And so I think that's why we're getting like a lot of different forms, a lot of different um, ways of dealing with the blank. I just wondered if any of the students wanted to talk about, try to talk about ornament. It's not something we've talked about throughout the semester, but I think it is important now as like, you know, stepping away and looking at what's been made um you know because in like a lift case the first project the shiplap like the shiplap is like a you know a rain uh cladding system right for domestic houses and to scale it up at the scale of the tower and interlock it as you would um you know domestic shiplap um that's starting to kind of project um an idea which goes back to what maybe jill said which is like CLT makes you start over as an architect. Like nobody would think to do, we would never put shiplap siding at the scale of a tower um, unless we had the CLT blank as the tectonic system to do such. So I, I think, yeah, starting over as an architect um, with this material, it does kind of throw things, what we know kind of out, I think. Students want to say something or uh, just to Peter's point about structure because it weighs a fifth of what concrete weighs it's quite deceiving so they can jump around and create transfer structures and it's very very light I just wanted to say that but um, Daniel do you want to say something about ornament sure yeah I mean I think uh, different people tackled it in different ways or yeah. maybe didn't address it um, directly but like but I would say Ed and I um, had similar approaches to kind of leveraging the manufacturing process and not just using it for precision and manufacture. Um, and then in Aleph's case, 
you know, the tectonic, like Jennifer just said, becomes a sort of large scale ornament, but it's driven by the dimensions of the CLT. So I think, you know, without, I, at least in my case, I thought that there was, you know, this digitization of CLT that begs, you know, kind of into, uh, interrogation of ornament through the digital lens without necessarily falling back on like parametric tropes. And that's sort of what I was interested in. And so it kind of comes out in this uh, exaggerated um, brushstroke pattern. And, you know, to Peter's point about the, the work that we produced in the house, I mean, we not only did we condense the tower presentations down to like three minutes, but we also have a whole other project that it's, there's, there was a lot of, a lot of work and a lot of um, consideration at different scales. And so I think if we were able to take a deeper look with, at some of these images, there would be a lot to discover about, about you know, how we each approached aesthetics of wood, image, and ornament, or you know, how we did, may or may not have addressed those things. Yeah, I think the, um, I'm not sure I need the shiplap iconography to appreciate Aleph's tower. I can see that it came from that. In fact, all the stories of where the buildings came from were a complete surprise to me. I just saw the images and had no idea where they'd come from. And so that was, I mean, in Kiat's tables kind of vanish by the time he's done, but I quite like the building. So it's, and I, I don't, I don't know that I need the narrative of where where it came from. I mean, for example, in the the Elif's building, I'm happy to treat those as kind of tentative horizons, and the way that they interact with the different windows is, I think, a really significant way of understanding tower potential narrative, potential relationships between things, and yet it's not um, something that's kind of hitting me over the head or you know, it's it's not Rockefeller Center where I've got, you know, Atlas holding up the world and Rockefeller polishing Atlas's toenails. I it's got a it's got a kind of innocence and resonance with respect to the tower and scale of the tower. And I think a number of people discovered items like this that I think I mean maybe they aren't only possible in CLT, but they certainly work best in CLT and when you start playing with it, you end up with a configuration that is unlike any other form of, you know, construction. And so I thought those discoveries, you know, I would, I would put Piria's um, mass timber as um, CO2 storage in the, in the same league. They, they, they came from really understanding the material and its possibilities. And you know why to do this stuff in a school? I don't know if you'd be allowed to try it <laughs> on site, as it were. But it, you know, by pushing it, it becomes much more convincing than if it's just you know kind of tossed across the table as an idea. Any of the students, Kiat, you had a mention there. Do you want to say something? I think. Um, the notion that you have something that is an affordance of this kind that just sort of sits in the background, you know, it's until you discover a table that's only eight inches off the ground or that you can walk under as, as a kid that they start becoming strange. And so to that extent, I, I don't need tables and the final thing that it, I, I think it's one of those sort of myths that as a, you know, let, let's say it's still run by Ikea that, or legends, stories that would you know be part of the attraction of the building and the fact that it's somewhat hidden is is almost the best part of it that if it was very explicit it would be just a sort of didactic landscape and it would lose its capacity to be so many other things mm -hmm. any of the uh, I have a follow up on that, on like the ornamentation and tonic, because for example, like Versailles is just so ornate and now is somewhat materially ornate. If you refer to the movie, the Her, where in the future it looks almost the same, but everything, like the material thing disappeared to become something really like technological and it exists in the space that is not material wise. Do you think 
this could be applied to like the way that we're going forward now to the future like less material and more immaterial but technologically advanced things maybe to to pick up on the ornament discussion because i think that like that is an interesting one in this context for me um i mean i would say that so when clt resets a lot of architectural rules i think it also has uh, somehow a strange relationship with scale it almost seems like that at some point it becomes agnostic to scale and i think in a lot of the projects like the especially probably the clt cross laminated uh, tower project it's clear that we actually see an operation that happens on a very small scale then all of a sudden repeat on a very big scale and in a number of projects we see this kind of um, scale agnosticism like you could also argue that the table project in, in, in one way or another does that and as a result it's true that we see operations that used to happen on a very small scale in architecture that maybe were to a certain extent decorative that they all of a sudden happen on that kind of structural level and like that's something that I, that I think we can see across um, a lot of the tower projects like also the precarious assembly one in, in one way or another does that as well um yeah yeah i want to touch again briefly on this i think oh sorry go on please no no carry on. okay yeah no um i think that the 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 idea of creating a new technology uh with the clt it's uh it's uh all to be seen meaning that um there is i think as I've seen it applied in uh, in uh, the final seven images, it feels very much bidimensional, and I think in um, uh, it would be interesting to explore maybe in a second round how those uh, flat surfaces could in reality be transformed more in mass. It's not. It's never going to be concrete, uh, but somehow concrete has its own gymnastics and its own way of being you know being seen and transformed and become something completely different depending on your own design and um, i really look forward to see some examples in which you know this bidimensionality of the material is broken and and we really try we really get to understand which are the possibilities of you know subtracting mass from you know, a cube of uh, um, CLT and how then it will reveal its own ornament that is, uh, that is, you know, all of the veins of the different stratification of the, of the wood. And how, I don't know how this will apply. I mean, I'm, I'm really open uh, to see wh what are the potential here, but I think there is this step that still has to happen in the way we use CLT. And, and the jump and the potentiality of you know creating spaces, uh, three-dimensional spaces out of this material, uh, and the rules uh, that, you, that we will have to discover are uh, very much uh, important. Mm. So that for for me the ornamental part, I mean, I work in an office that is you can say a, a extremely looking at uh, shapes and 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 the way they convey, uh, you know, lights and, and, and feelings in, in the space itself, very three-dimensional. And I really would like to look more at this material, not only as, as you know, finishing inside the room, but more like how it works structurally to, to be able to, to, to grasp his own intelligence. Hmm. Rose, I'm going to give you the last word because we're about to run out of time. But that's <laughs> no, I was Ooh. just going to say, actually, to finish on that, you know, I think this kind of what these projects show is just the opportunity. And I think certainly as a material, what the, the future could be. And the, I think the paper slab ready made column, you know, shows this thinness, which is really exciting. Uh, it, you know, it's something that has perception to material is is transformed plus it must smell great in these buildings you know <laughs> the smell of wood you know it could be it's a new world so it's pretty exciting in that sense yeah thank you again yeah i'd just like to say thank you for inviting me this is really really stimulating two questions which, which i'm not going to address 
one, the significance of the metal clip and the way this stuff is put together, and mm. two, the question of aging, and for exposed surfaces, yeah. how slippery do they get, and so forth. But you know, another time, really, really interesting, and I'm, I'm going away with all sorts of thoughts. I think it's great, and well done, students.